everyone can just mute themselves. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Tanya Richards. Uh, I think we're waiting for a few more, but I think we're going to start going to respect everybody's time. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm fortunate to be on the unceded territory of the Semiama First Nation. I reside in uh, White Rock. Um, second, I just want to thank everybody for their time today for joining us. I'm so thrilled to actually say that besides having uh, people join us from all over British Columbia and lower mainland of Vancouver, we have friends from uh, the East Coast and, uh, and Calgary. We have some American friends and we even have a few people joining us from as far away as Mumbai and Dubai, which I think we can all acknowledge is one of these wonderful byproducts that we've experienced through COVID, which I'm sure these panelists are gonna jump into today. I also wanna thank our panelists in advance and our moderator for their time. Um, we've been listening to some of these stories over the last few days and I think there's a lot of amazing content that we're going to hear today and uh, hopefully people like myself that are working with our uh, nice shirt on top and sweatpants on the bottom are going to have a, a good learning by the end of today of how to shake that off and and move forward in a more collaborative fashion. Um, for anybody on the call today who uh, is not a member of SMCC or has never joined any of our sessions, please feel free to go to our website. You can sign up for our newsletter. We have a lot of great content right now that's going out. We have a lot of free um, webinars uh, from all over Canada that you can register for and uh, join in other conversations. So without some further ado, please take it away. Steph Corker, actually Steph, sorry, let me introduce you. So Steph is um, many things. First of all, she's one of the most enthusiastic people I've ever met. And I think your motto even says you're, it's contagious, but it, but it is. She's, uh, she's well-spoken and super exciting. And I'm really excited for where she's going to take us today. She's an HR specialist. She's the founder uh, and proprietor of the Corker Collection, and she is actually a professional uh, athlete. She's a tra uh, your triathlon, right? Is that right? No, an Ironman. Sorry. Stop. <laughs> but anyway, stop. Take it away. Oh, bless. It's always so tricky when someone else intros you and you're sitting here on camera on Zoom. So thank you, Tanya, for the opportunity and the chance to get together. My name is Steph Corker. My pronouns are she, her. Uh, I do run the Corker Collective, which is an HR consulting business because I'm as obsessed with human capital as venture capitals are with money. Uh, I am, along with the panelists, coming to you today from the unceded coastal territory of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh, and I'm grateful to live, work, and play here. 
I would love for our panelists to introduce themselves and then we will get into conversation. I want the attendees to know that um, we will riff on conversation across the panel and make time for questions. We have Tanya moderating the Q&A and so I will riff with the panelists for as long as we can until we need to take a question. Uh, know that your questions are being read and we will do our best to get through that. We're here together for an hour. We will honor time and um, yeah, honor a conversation that really matters because we're not out of it yet. We're still six feet apart. Polly, let's start with you. Uh, so my name is Polly Tracy and I'm the Vice President of Communications and Public Affairs at Best Buy Canada. Um, and as you can tell, I'm English um, and I've been in Vancouver for about five years and I love it here for all sorts of reasons. David? Uh, hi. Uh, my name is David Rutesi. Uh, my pronouns are uh, he, him, his. Um, I am the executive director of the Vancouver Mural Festival and I'm also one of the co founders of the nonprofit and the event. Um, we run, uh, we run a, one of Canada's largest public art uh, festivals, but we also produce pieces uh, year round uh, in the Vancouver area as well as events. Amazing. Thank you. Lisa. Hi, uh, my name is Lisa and I'm in Vancouver as well. And I'm the Senior Director of Marketing and Communications at Arts Umbrella, which is an art education center for children. And our whole mission, our mantra is to provide access to art for as many children as humanly possible free of charge. So it's, uh, it's great to be here. I'm glad we're gonna riff today. Staff, that sounds really fun. Okay, good. I'm glad you're in because you're on the panel. Yeah. And lastly, we have Scott. Hi, I'm Scott. Uh, David and I shop at the same store. Uh, I'm the senior manager, uh, partnerships and regional brand for Rogers Communication based in Vancouver. Wonderful. All right. So the essence of today, or I would like to talk to three pillars. Um, the first is collaboration. The second will be innovation. And the third is we'll get into what that means for you both personally and, and professionally within your business. So um, this is a, a pillar one I would like everyone to speak to. Um, and Scott, we'll kick it off with you actually. And, and that is how have you, um, dare I say, leveraged this time to collaborate internally in a different way? So an internal example of COVID. Of COVID collaboration. COVID yeah. gone and right. COVID gone right. Yeah, I think um, so a little bit about my organization for collaboration purposes. Um, we're obviously across the country. A lot of my colleagues are based in other provinces, other areas. And so from a collaboration perspective, I think we had maybe been even for a telco, we hadn't been really challenging ourselves to try to use technology to collaborate, knowing that we were all in separate districts, separate areas. And so we've had to escalate our own internal access to technology. We're fully deployed for us, it's Microsoft. So we've been using a lot of the Microsoft tool suite and that has been helpful. It also helps that people have the mindset now that they need to try to be more collaborative. So we've been engaging people in different types of sessions, the length, using some of the new unique tools that exist for us to be able to, to actually uh, to find ways to still be innovative where we can't meet in person and talk. Mm, got it. And um, one important piece I think of note is what is the size of Rogers across Canada? Employee size? Yeah. 26,000 employees, give or take. It's like half the size of the town I grew up in. So it's a lot of humans. Got it. Um, Lisa, I want to flip it over to you next. Can you share, share an example of internal collaboration? Absolutely. Over Can I, are you okay if I take the internal collaboration and show how it helped us with an external collaboration? We have to, well, sure. Yeah, go external too. You're external. It, it really is. And what we, um, because we're all about ensuring that we can, um, there's probably 20,000 children that actually um, gain access to art through um, Arts Umbrella free of charge a year. So on March 16th, that just came to a grinding halt. So internally, we brought together fund development, we brought together our creative teams, we brought together our senior management, and together we figured out how we could continue that service during COVID. So fund development found a donor. The creative people started putting together uh, creative prompts that could be sent out. 
Um, and we found a partner um, in particular, Opus, who would actually supply us with art supplies from um, sketchbooks to uh, markers to this, that, and the other. And together, these relationships that we had found internally, we were able to uh, go out into the community, which we love to do, um, and deliver hundreds of art kits to families in need. And as you can imagine, the pulling together internally really was um, met with a, a really good news story um, that actually is going to continue in the future. So I think just that collaboration in, in, inside Arts Umbrella really enabled us to continue uh, doing some really good work for the community. Amazing. Uh, I think it's important to acknowledge where we, if we don't come together internally, we can't be of greatest service externally. And that's why we've started with this internal question. And so Lisa, I love how you acknowledge internal and then the impact has obviously been enormous and that's wonderful. Um, Polly, let's go to you next. Yeah, so I actually would say that COVID has driven greater collaboration than ever before. Um, and in the early days, the, the best example was probably literally when we had to change our store operations. We had to collaborate with every single department to make sure customers, employees, everyone knew. But my favorite example would be how our town halls have changed. So in the olden days, we'd have a, olden days, six months ago, we'd have um, a town hall that would be just for our corporate employees, or we'd have one that was, we'd gather all our store leaders together. Um, and that would be a separate thing, we'd have to hire a hotel. Now we can have everyone together, you know, thousands of people on a, on a call, on a Teams call, um, and we're reaching our field at the same time as we're reaching our distribution centers at the same time as we're reaching our uh, corporate colleagues. And just recently, we actually then did it back. So we had broadcasts from the distribution centers, from the stores, and we just got this amazing energy that felt a bit like one of those broadcasts during the Olympics when you say, and now we're going to the swimming pool, now we're going to the racetrack, but in fact, we were going out to our employees in the field. So I think collaboration is one of the, the best outcomes of this period. I love it. And again, Best Buy is enormous. Um, what is head office at right now or head office and distribution centers from an employee perspective? Uh, so head office is 1,200, but we're all working from home and across the country we're 12 and a half thousand. Great. And I bring this up because I think in numbers, we don't give credit to the fact that, in, that collaboration is still super possible and ways that we thought, we, you know, you can never do this with 1,200 employees and you are. And so 1,200 or 12, it's possible. David, how about you? And I know that you'll touch on the internal and external impact. Yeah. Um, yeah, everything for us, everything we do internally, you know, because we're a, a, a primarily, you know, mural and events organization uh, is external <laughs> in the end. But, um, you know, I think when, when, when March rolled around and, and things, um, you know, really became difficult in terms of bringing people together and, and, and understanding what the future was going to be. Um, you know, we really were able to bring our team together, uh, you know, digitally to, to really have conversations about what you know, was going to happen, really, you know, stepped up in, in, as many organizations have in our, in our digital sort of internal workings. But it was actually through those sessions and having that sort of added, those added touch points that we sort of started to re- assess how the whole organization was going to move. And it started with this one idea that came from, um, you know, our director of operations in one of these, these sort of conversations around uh, the boarded up shops across Van Vancouver, and then reaching out to some of um, our, you know, our very close partners, uh, which are the business improvement associations. Um, uh, and across Vancouver and and we actually worked with them to that idea actually ended up translating into about 60 murals across you know downtown and a number of areas here in Vancouver um, and that actually and I'm sure I'll get into it later but ended up being a gateway into a whole bunch of other possibilities and a whole sort of new approach to you know how we were doing our actual festival and also our year-round activities as well so it's it's having that added, you know, internal, uh, like in some ways it's almost like you, because you have to be actively collaborative and, and even, it's not like, hey, we're all in the same place. We're all kind of like, you know, 
it's osmosis. It's so much more intentional to be like, okay, no, we have to have these meetings. We have to gather in this space. Even, you know, those people who hate being on Slack and hate being on Zoom, you know, they're actually like, fine, I'll be at the meeting. Um, and it's really resulted in sort of a deeper collaboration for the whole organization. Amazing. Um, for people that might not be in the Vancouver core area or didn't witness what the boarded up shops of Vancouver looked like, um, I did hear an interesting fact to share, and that was um, pre at this time last year, there was about 450,000 um, people foot traffic in our downtown core, which is really like a few blocks. Um, this year, it's at 115,000, so basically 25%. And sadly, a large portion of that are either people that are going to office buildings and must stay in those, or our homeless population. And our homeless population um, was in dire need early on. And so if you're not in Vancouver, you might not quite understand. I'm not sure what the situation was in other cities, but in Vancouver, unfortunately, it was quite serious. And so we know our downtown core was, was boarded and David made it beautiful. So thank well, you for that. Not me specifically. <laughs> and that's a beautiful thing. Are so um, we, I, we have a great question that's come in that feels appropriate. And Polly, I'm going to push this to you. Um, <clears throat> And I'm not sure if you will have an answer, but let's try it on. And that okay. is um, for stores that have relied on in-person demos or samplings or hands-on um, interactions that obviously don't exist or it's not possible within um, health and safety regulations now, how have you switched that in-store experience? I feel like yeah. that's someone from Costco, you know, how are they getting those samples? <laughs> This is a great question. So we've gone through different phases actually with hands on demos. So there was that very intense period when actually you couldn't go into our stores at all and you could only um, pick things up that you'd ordered online. And then we gradually opened up our stores with a, a kind of escort service. You know, you could shop and someone would be with you, but you couldn't touch. And then, and then we started looking at, well, how can we, some of the things that people need to touch, how can we make that safe? And so introduce um, all of the kind of clinical protocols to make that safe. Um, so you can now touch some things. There's some things that we still, that you still can't. Um, but at the same time as, as that, we've been introducing more digital touch points than ever before. So um, thousands and thousands of reviews online to help people um, research before they come into store. We introduce Blue Shirt Chat, so you can actually chat to one of our associates and ask them questions before you come into store. We have tons of videos available. So very, very mindful that people want to see um, and want to know as much about a product. And this Are we here? Can someone tell me if they're here? We're all here, I think, okay. yeah. It was just Polly. Polly this, is the, okay. this is the COVID reality of the pause in the unfortunate freeze phase. Yeah. <laughs> oh, when did I freeze? Oh, there you are. <laughs> we lost you at Blue Shirts, Polly. Uh, so Blue Shirt Chat, so we introduced the uh, ability to chat to Blue Shirts online um, and, and, and other digital touch points so that we know people really want to um, get to know a product before they purchase it. So doing as much research online and then you can go into store and there's some things you can touch that we've made it safe to do so. Got it. Okay. <laughs> I want us to carry on. Um, and, and the, the beautiful sister, if you will, the cousin to collaboration is innovation. And I think we've all touched on it um, in our own ways. Um, Scott, you, I know, have a great example of innovating from an industry perspective. Industry has been caused, called, and is caused to innovate. Mm -hmm. um, what have you done at Rogers? What does that look like? Yeah, and thanks. It's a, a great question. And innovation, I think, so we have some very typical um, sponsorship properties that we work with, sports and music. But um, with sports obviously being, uh, especially in the early days of the pandemic, something that just wasn't accessible, we were looking to try to find ways. And we were, I think the best part about this is that we were all trying to look at things that make a difference and things that, you know, weren't typical, uh, just brand affiliations, but ways that we could feel like we were connecting to a community and something that we could add value to. So um, my real lens is, is BC and the region of, of BC and trying to make a difference here. Um, I sit across a team that uh, is that's responsible for, for all the country, but I do focus mostly here. And so we looked at 
a group uh, with our media properties, our radio stations, we looked at a way that we thought we could help a group that wasn't receiving a benefit, uh, which was artists that were smaller in nature, ones that just weren't booking venues, big venues, and you know, they maybe didn't have reserves to, to wait and sit back on. And so we reached out to a local um, a firm here that's, uh, that's actually called Side Door Access, which I encourage you to look at. It's a really innovative program. And we partnered with them to help put on a program to sponsor local artists to be able to perform on Side Door. Um, and then the artists were able to charge a gate admission and that gate admission was given back to charity. So essentially we paid the artists so they had a guaranteed income and then the artists themselves were able to charge for their performance and that was to give back to a charity that the artists was able to, to choose. So it gave the artist a way to, to give back to their charity and to speak to their community. It gave them a chance to perform. Um, in some cases, it actually helped those artists get online and into a place where they were able to uh, use some of that funds for technology so that they were able to, to be more present online because a lot of artists were really struggling to try to figure out where they'd be relevant. And for us, it gave us a place that we could do um, from a brand perspective, we could be present in media and music. That is one of our core pillars. We could help our radio programs because we wanted something that would fill programming. But we also have something that felt good, that felt like it was valid and useful in the, in the, especially in the early days of the pandemic when there was a lot of doom and gloom and definitely you were looking for as much good news as you can. This felt like a nice good news story about helping everybody all around. Amazing. Um, uh, so appreciated. And, and I think I missed the name. If anybody wants to look it up, it was called the Mainland Music Series. Um, and that's uh, the mark against me for my br own brand learning, but it was the Mainland Music Series that we helped partner with. Great. These are, I mean, we think of the arts and I love that we have both yourself and David and Lisa on this because it's easy to think corporately we have to shut doors down, but what about people that have given their life, their vocation to express themselves and what does that look like now? So um, I love that you have chosen to collaborate externally that way. Okay. We do have an art focus. We actually partner with the Vancouver Art Gallery and the Polygon Art Gallery as well. So art is a focus point and it was a very interesting discussion about how to help art in the, in the era where people couldn't come and view it. Were there ways yeah. to help them connect? Yeah, I think it's a big conversation and David, we're going to go to you next because the idea of coming together and what is the new coming together and I love your perspective on what that is um, or what it on acknowledging that it's not what it was and we don't need to sit and live in trying to recreate that now. Um, yeah. Riff, yeah, that was tell me more. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, um, I think like everyone, there was a, you know, a, a period of time where we were, we, it kept changing, right? Every day and every, you know, couple of days it was like, oh, now it's this, now it's that, now it's this. And we we're like, oh my God, what are we gonna do? So, you know, you really do start from a place of like, okay, how can we do what we were gonna do um, but just change it a little bit, right? Um, and I think it quickly became obvious that, you know, through our internal discussions, that that wasn't going to be the case. And at a certain point, it, we, we really said, you know what, we need to step back and like, um, and re-examine everything, you know, because it's not, things aren't the same. They aren't going to be the same. Even, you know, when we have some recovery, things are going to be different. Um, there's a, a lot of change that's happened. Uh, we were discussing this yesterday in our pre-call, like there's just a ton of change and, uh, and technology adoption and like all sorts of behavioral patterns are changing. So I think it's what we found was like, as soon as we shifted our lens to just look at the landscape and say, okay, well, what do we actually have going for us? And like, what can we do um, and what's needed um, and get back to, right back to our values of like why in mission and vision and like, why are we here? What are we trying to accomplish? and then apply it to the new situation. I think we we found doors, it feels like doors were opening, you know, it felt like the, the river was unblocked and all of a sudden we just, it felt really natural and we ended up in a number of programs. So specifically, you know, opening this door to the, um, the, the ordered up murals. You know, once we did that, even though we didn't really have the staff to make that work at the time, we just sort of made it happen because it was the right thing. It was, it, was, it made sense for us. Um, that opened a series of other doors um, into uh, 
in for the festival. So the festival itself, actually, which is typically, um, you know, it's 10 days, it's been 10 days, it's about 150, 200,000 people that come for our street party on one of the days in Mount Pleasant. And we focus primarily on this one area of Vancouver called Mount Pleasant. Um, it's expanded this year. So we ended up being in, you know, nine neighborhoods, 60 plus murals, um, you know, and, and ended up with an app as well, which allows us to be, you know, even more year round than usual. So all these things happen because we just stopped trying to be what we used to be, you know, and this, the quicker we could do that. And I feel this way for anyone who's asked me about this previously is like the quicker you can try and get that out of the way and be like, no, what are we going to do now? I think okay, is wait, the mic drop moment that everyone needs to take away is stop <laughs> trying to do what we used to do. Yeah. It's brilliant. Stop trying to do what we used to do. I do want to dig just a little bit deeper into your app conversation. There are people that are definitely interested. Uh oh, am I frozen? I'm here. Mm -hmm. um, app conversation. What was the app? How did you leverage it? Um, was yeah. this augmented reality or not? Well, How are we going digital with a 200,000 person mural festival in a, for people that aren't in Vancouver? Mount Pleasant is a small little community, a sweet small community. <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, and actually I find this interesting too, you know, and everyone went digital right away, right? Like everyone was like, okay, I guess everything's digital. And, and we're, I feel like we're one of the only festivals left standing that wasn't, you know, just a couple of us that aren't completely digital. Um, and we considered it though. We went, okay, I guess we're going into all these Zoom workshops and it's going to be, because that's what everyone else was doing. And we really stopped and we're like, no, like, wait a minute. Like, we don't know how to do that. We know how to do this. And fortunately enough murals, you know, were unaffected, right? So what we've ended up with uh, was this, we actually had a grant from the Canada Council um, for the Arts to create this app. It's basically um, uh, a resource to find all the murals we've created, hundreds of murals over, I think we've produced over 300 projects in Vancouver in the last five years including the largest pieces of Coast Salish art, the largest pieces, probably the largest pieces of indigenous art, public art, um, you know, and working with tons of uh, communities that, uh, and artists who don't typically get to work in the mural space. It's like a lot of like women art even is common in the mural and art and graffiti space. So just working with um, all sorts of artists who can bring their voices into public space. So that's all cataloged in this, uh, in this app. Um, and for the festival itself, it meant that people could explore it in their own time. So the festival ended up being three weeks this year um, and over three, even four weeks. And then even into the fall, we're seeing people using the app over and over to try and explore. And it's really fun. Even if you're not from Vancouver, you can explore all the murals that way and learn about them. Yeah. I will tell you that my father-in-law has an e-bike and he rides around Vancouver with his app, excited to see what mural he will discover on his bike ride that day. And if I ever thought my father-in-law would have a phone, have an e-bike, ride around town, these are all really interesting things that are occurring. And so, brilliant. Yeah. Um, Polly, I want to flip it to you um, because you have a great lens both on what is occurring externally in the world, how we're innovating our lives and what that impact has been um, to Best Buy. Um, yeah, I mean, Thank goodness Best Buy is an innovative company because what we have done before this period has helped us in this period. So things like we introduced, um, we were the first bricks and mortar retailer to introduce a marketplace. Now people uh, need laptops all day long, every day, because people are working from home, kids need laptops. And so during this period, we have our Best Buy inventory and then we have our marketplace. And there's been times when our marketplace has blown up our um so many so much more revenue from the marketplace this year it's just expanded our inventory so that's an example of how innovation that we set up way before the pandemic has helped us this year um in general um we've also had to work on things this year so this holiday people are going to want to shop in different ways um and we we um introduced curbside pickup I think we created it in about a week um, early at the beginning. So we're thinking April um, this year. And then we spent a few months um, refining it to make it better for this holiday so that people will be able to come to store and not even leave their car to pick things up. Um, I think when you're talking about how have people changed and how have, 
how has innovation changed people's lives? Well, my goodness, um, the adoption of technology this year has just gone through the roof. And there's stats that have said that where we thought Canada would be by 2025, um, we're at now. So the last five months, people have started using technology to monitor their health. People obviously are doing Zoom calls more than ever before. And people used to get on a plane for a few hours to fly to Toronto to do meetings. And now that's not happening. So um, there's no question that technology has been an answer for so many things for us this year. Um, and we're grateful at Best Buy for that. Um, and I think people out in the field have shown us that they need the products that we sell. So that's awesome. Yeah, right on. All right, Lisa, external innovation. Yeah, we, um, Arts Umbrella has 300 instructors that were um, lost their jobs as of mid-March. So not to say that innovation wasn't an issue, but there was a lot of brainstorming and innovating going on for the instructors to figure out how they could still continue to do um their jobs so just an aside we did Wait, Lisa, can i clarify yep. these are 300 instructors are paid full-time or are they volunteering for arts umbrella how does that paid. work paid so 300 paid instructors yeah all of a sudden don't have work yeah so the best the most obvious thing that we did um was we took uh, a lot of our theater classes a lot of script writing that type of thing uh, dance and art and design online, which sounds like, oh, obvious to do. We've been planning that for years and it probably would have taken years to instill those classes. We are now running half of our classes online very successfully. So that's just one thing and it's obvious, but I, I just know pre-COVID it wouldn't have happened as successfully as it has. The example though that I wanted to let you guys know about was really about how COVID has forced us to because as Steph keeps saying, we're six feet apart, how do we still um, offer some courses by using spaces in our environment creatively? Obviously, uh, David does that with the murals, but uh, one of our most popular classes, um, and I think it's worldwide, it's really taking an, a, an upward curve, is musical theater. It helps children with self-confidence and a whole host of other things. And singing is not happening during COVID, uh, and it's not going to happen for a long time in an indoor space. So fast forward, we're in a room trying to innovate and trying to figure out how to protect these programs that are so instrumental in our community. And uh, we found through a relationship um, with uh, an area of town here in Vancouver that um, has a fourth floor of a garage, like picture a concrete structure that no one ever looks at for anything other than cars. It's got open sides, open windows. And we worked with some partners to bring in curtains, bring in, bring in a rug, bring in microphones, bring in um, uh, things to purify the air. And we are doing musical theater in this top floor, non-romantic non environment, but so, so amazing to see these kids and this new space has let us get more kids out they're now not on their computers at home and we will probably continue this in, indefinitely so we've done other things in cool spaces i won't drag on but it's really looking around and seeing the opportunities with um uh, spaces either in downtown or um, anywhere just to look at them differently and see how you can uh, take those opportunities to uh, continue to innovate. Yeah, space, space apart, unromantic spaces are becoming so sexy. So romantic. <laughs> so yeah. romantic, yes. Yeah. Um, we have a question and I'm not sure who is the right person to answer this. Um, so I'm going to pose the question. Scott, it might be yourself, Lisa. We all are in the impact of, uh, okay, wait, this is going to be a two-part question. The first part is we are now offering things online for free that we once used to pay a ticket price for. And how do you envision the future going when things that you used to feel, you used to pay a ticket price for, you now have access for free 
And are we going to start charging for this? Are we not? Is there a different angle? I know um, Tanya, in, in my conversations with Tanya, she shared with me ESPNW, which is an amazing conference in New York. I think it's like $5,000 to attend or something every year, um, is now for free. And they're just opening up this incredible speaker lineup for two days and it's free content. Um, how do you envision this changing? And do we need to like, adhere to David's mic drop that it's just different now or will we ever be able to charge five thousand dollars again and I'm curious and the reason it's a two-part is one maybe Scott you could speak to this or David I'd like to know from a corporate perspective your experience but then secondly I'm curious about you as marketers on this panel will you pay for something again in that regard so let's start one Scott over to you corporate thanks very much yeah, and you know, it's funny actually, in the previous versions I actually was an event organizer for conferences. And so I'm, I pondered this question myself, yeah. what I would do. I think, again, a little, a little bit of my old hat, but I think there was, there was a debate before about digital uh, experience of events and conferences. And it was always kind of a separate work stream, but people wanted to, they get more buzz being together. They get more ideas, the innovation occurs. This is all we keep talking about. I mean, all technological tools do is get us a little closer, but they don't recreate the buzz. So I think truthfully, um, there's really not a way that we ever get away from the buzz of being in a live event environment for you know broad spectrum. Um, but I do think, talking to David's point and the mic drop, I think digital events now have to get better we these are revenue streams people are going to have to make up additional you know um incomes that they didn't have and digital events don't have an excuse of not having a testing ground and a place to go they need to be their own separate opportunities that that take advantage of what isn't available live. It's very hard to focus on two different things at an event. You typically would go, you'd hear one work stream, then you'd go to the next room and hear another work stream. Could you be interactive? Are you putting your hand? Like the, a lot of the limitations existed. Technology doesn't have those problems. You can interact live, you can have virtual hosts, you can receive content before and after that you can parse and realize. So I think the industry like will innovate, will move, will take this, testing ground and add to, but I can't see it replicating the buzz of us being in the same room together, feeding off each other. Zoom fatigue and all of these other buzzwords mean we just aren't there. And I, you know, short of a hundred year evolutionary jump, I don't see us doing that in the, in the near future. You know what I think is so fascinating and part of me has the athlete hat on that's like, yeah, you're fatigued until you practice and you're fatigued until we get good at it. We're fatigued until we're forced to be on Zoom. And the last con concert I went to was sweet freaking Elton John and everyone watched Elton John through their phones. And I was like, interesting. We're all here recording this. If we just put our phone down, we could be with Elton, you know? Um, Elton, I'll never get to dance with you again. So. I do I agree. You get better. I think we will get we better. Get better. We I just don't better. know what better or forever. I, I really do believe people yeah. get a buzz from being together, but I think Absolutely. we are getting better at it. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, there are so many, and this is totally inappropriate, but we're human and we should talk about this. It's like sex. It's better in person. Right. All right. So um, one other person, David, do you have thoughts on um, paying for things? <laughs> It's a good one, right? That's good. Yeah. Good. No, I really, uh, first of all, I echo what Scott Didn't said. want you to transfer from your comment about sex to paying for things. I feel bad for David. <laughs> so I think there should be sorry, a, sorry. a gap between those two things. Yeah. Sorry. I echo what Scott says. But, and I think it's about like, you know, once again, and I think Side Door, which you talked about, Scott, is like a good, is a great example. Um, uh, you know, a lot of the bands that are going through side door are really saying, wow, it's amazing to have such a, a new experience. It's not a live show. It's not a replacement for a live show. It is a new thing and it has its own advantages and its own things that are better than live shows. It is missing other things that are the amazing things about live shows. So I think that there's a, there's a level of access, collaboration, community that's able to be built through these digital platforms and it's only going to get better. I think there are ways to even tier that, you know, when you're, when you're uh, sorry, did my computer just blow up? Sorry. No. Okay. <laughs> You're with us. Uh, good. Um, yeah, sometimes, uh, I think like the, there, there's ways to tier that. So, you know, uh, are you just a viewer? Do you get to access? Do you get to go into breakout groups and talk to the speakers? Like there's lots of ways to tier things out and to make the content awesome. But, um, 
I think, yeah, you'll want to pay for um, that in person. And if anything, this makes the in person experience more valuable because this is so it's much, this is going to become much more common. So when you are able to have those in-person um, conversations, when you are, when you do get to sit in the actual room with the person, then that's going to feel really special once, once that's a, a reality again, even if the numbers aren't quite as big or whatever, you know, those stipulations are. Yeah. I don't, I mean, restaurants obviously have been hit drastically in this and it's like, I just can't wait to have a dinner party again. And nothing will replicate that. Not on Zoom, like not with my selfie camera watching other people eat dinner. Like I want to make you dinner. Um, and I think that people feel the same way about events. I, you know, we want to be together and we won't forget that that costs money. Steph, I'd love to add to that as well. Yeah, Polly, I want you to go and Lisa, I'm, I'm coming into you right next, but you hit it, Polly. Um, so, and I'm going to draw from a couple of industry examples. So I started my career at Sony Music and it was when we were going through the, um, we were actually suing Apple at the time for digital downloads because this was when digital downloads first started. And the idea that it would cost 79 cents to download something was horrific to the music industry. Um, but we saw an evolution and we adapted and now that's the new model. The same thing happened with Netflix. People moved from, from cable to to, to Netflix. The same thing's now happening with computer games and it's going to be a membership model. And I think that events is going to be a similar thing. There hopefully will go back to some live events, but the, the, uh, the area of digital events is just going to grow and grow and grow and be monetized in lots of different ways. And great content is always going to have a value. We saw influencers go through this kind of process as well. Um, and, and they've worked out a, a model on it. And I would just plea, having gone through it in the music industry and, and then seeing the uh, film industry slow to catch up that this was happening, I think it's just the plea to the events industry that we have to come up with the solutions so that people don't get left behind. Because monetization through advertising, bigger audiences, now we're doing digital conferences. There's, um, the future is, is bright as long as we embrace the evolution. You know, another brilliant example is TED. Think about the TED experience, which is probably hosted in our town of Vancouver, which will be canceled for two consecutive years. And yet they're pulling on TEDx around the world and they have a channel that has forever offered it as free content. So there's another um, example of digital and in, in real life experiences on both sides. Lisa, I know you have a great example. Can you share that with us too from a nonprofit perspective? Yeah, I just, I did want to jump in here because um, I love that you brought it up. We have spent hours talking about this. You know, do we offer free art classes? Do we, you know, yeah. what, what is free and what is not? Um, and as a not-for-profit, um, we just can't continue to give free. So it's not a reality for us. But what we've decided to do, and we have a gala coming up in 10 days time, um, we are charging full pop as if you're in the ballroom downtown Vancouver. So you're going to pay $500, but your experience that we're going to give is going to be the same experience that you would have had before. So we're ensuring that people that are in um, sort of a hub watching uh, the gala or participating at home, the home people are going to have catered dinner come to the door. We're going to do everything we can to ensure that the experience is uh, as they expected and the experience matches the price point. And we felt that if we took away that, even a discounted ticket, they would probably expect a lesser product. So we're just trying to keep the bar up there and, and we'll see you know, how it goes. But it's, uh, it's definitely uh, been, a, it's been a lot of discussion. Um, and yeah, mm -hmm. we're just, again, we're innovating to figure out how, how we can do it um, and keep the experience mm -hmm. really positive. When people ask for discounts, I always think about walking into Whole Foods and asking for a discount on my organic bananas. You don't get a discount on organic bananas. You pay the price tag. And I think that it's important as marketers and as humans and as leaders that we remember that there are price tags put because it has taken years for, to rally people together to create what you're creating, the experience, the art, and you're doing it. And if you want to experience that, you pay for it. If you want organic bananas, you pay for it. And it would be beautiful if we could um, eliminate the idea that everything needs to be discounted somewhere along the line. I love that you're keeping the bar high, Lisa. Steph, we've all had garage sales and we try and give some, something away for free. People don't want it. They think yeah. something's wrong with it. Totally. Yeah. Art especially suffers. Oh, 
that, you know, the discount, constant discounting of, of what, of what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd love to take this, I'm mindful we have 15 minutes and I'd love to take this into a personal angle. And for the people listening in, if you have some questions that you want to ask about this by all means, um, but I think it's important, we acknowledge how this has impacted businesses and how businesses have innovated and leaders have innovated. And at the end of the day, we are human and we are humans experiencing this and we are humans that are showing up for work or for Zoom. And I want to know how you have, how you've taken this time from a personal angle to either grow or develop differently. How are you interacting with be it work folks or other humans um, differently from six feet apart? Because there are always examples from our personal lives that we can garner and pull into managing relationships at work or ideas and projects differently. Um, so can I ask all of you to, to share on that? Would you mind? Polly's smiling. You get to go first, Polly. Oh, no, I should stop smiling. Um, how am I approaching things? Well, actually, you know what? Because I, all my relatives are in Europe, my husband's Spanish and I'm English, um, I... I've embraced this period. I probably talked to them way more than I ever have before because, uh, you know, we've been um, teleconferencing and things all the time. Um, at, at work, we, we're working all the time on how do we keep the fun going um, in this new world. And um, there's no question that having a screen, it does, it does create a difference. Um, I, I think that the new world that we're that we're living in, and this applies to events, this applies to work, this applies to life. It's just about finding the balance on what can we take from how we used to be before, and what can we, um, what's new that we can add to our lives. I mean, things like some of my relief during the course of the day is walking my dog at lunchtime. The oldest activity in the world, but it's the thing that gives me energy to get through the afternoon. Um, it makes me laugh as I see him running. And, and then, of course, I go into the digital world of being on the computer all day. And then in the evening, I'll typically, you know, be surfing websites, looking for shopping, and I'll be watching Netflix. I just think it's about balance, and it's about a combination, adding some new things, but keeping hold of, keeping hold of some of the things, some of the old things that we love. I love that. And so I'm going to pose the, for the other three panelists, can you share your coping or thriving mechanism as well as one new thing, and which might be an old thing, like walking the dog? Scott, you're next. Um, I think, yeah, thanks for framing that question. I think uh, from, a, from a workplace perspective, you know, one of the things I'm pushing past is that um, there's, a, there's a weird barrier with technology where you don't always want to reach out to somebody where you would have stopped by a desk or gone and just had a knock knock on the side of the door conversation. So technology for me has been a bit more successful by kind of pushing past my uncomfortableness and saying, hey, can I, do you mind if we have a call? Maybe even uh, I'm getting up an unscheduled or unagended call just to talk. Like challenging the norm of saying, don't bother anybody unless you can physically see them and getting people to just agree to have conversations and go past the uncomfortable nature. That's been helpful because planning unscheduled conversations in a weird way is where I find the success is coming. I'm enjoying that. Um, and then I think, you know, I'm, maybe, it, maybe I'm out riding with your dad, but I bought an e-bike as well. And really? yeah, and I tell you, here's what I like about it. Um, and separate from an, uh, like a regular bike. I know there's a really strong crowd for this. E-bikes go fast and they make you focus. And I've lo I love this idea. And when I'm on that bike, I can only think about riding that bike all the time. And that's what I really wanted was something that pulled my focus strictly into the activity that I was doing. I couldn't think about anything else. So like Polly, I take a break, uh, mm. you know, sort of post afternoon, I get on that e-bike, I ride as, as fast as I think is safe. And then I, I let the other things go so that I can return home and then do family or like you say, other, other technology. But I need a break and I need an activity that drives my focus, just sort of a walk isn't enough for me to disengage. I do need something that drives me forward, that makes me think. Our mental health is not to be taken lightly and whatever it takes to take care of your mental health, um, be it an e-bike or a puppy is so, so important. So I love that, right on. If you see a man with a phone looking for murals, he's my <laughs> father-in-law. I'm going too fast really to have that conversation, but if I run into him, I'll make sure to let you know. Um, David, what about you? You know, I, I think that um, personally, a big challenge I've had through this time is um, it's really blurred the lines between my work life and my personal life. 
um, because you're spending so much time working from your from your home. And when you have, I have a two year old, um, and I think that's something that I've really had to work to try and create um, some division in. Um, and I think that's played back. Uh, and I'll say that because I think initially it, it, it was very hard. It was very hard for me. Um, I'm already someone who's passionate about what I do and it's, I take the work home with me anyway. So <laughs> the fact that my work never leaves home, <laughs> you know, it was maybe an issue. So I think we, um, it's really forced some really like some really intentional self-compassion around how to create space. And I think that that shift in, in a, a mindset, you know, has played into also how we're working with everybody else on our team. I think we're all, we've always been, you know, a pretty compassionate organization to our team, but it's like just trying to really impress upon people the need to have some balance and to and actually um, as a leader, you know, really um, force that on people because they won't force it on themselves a lot of the time. And so it can be hard because I do have things that like need to get done and, and deadlines and, you know, uh, budgets and all of those things that I'm freaking out about being like, how are we going to make this work? You know, especially in our line of work, we're almost always doing something really audacious that doesn't, you know, shouldn't by all measures happen, but we're doing it anyway. Um, but to step back and be like, no, it's, it is way more important that I draw a line in the sand for this person today. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. and then say, don't work tonight, you know, go home or do what you got to do. Like, just please don't work. Um, yeah. because it's, it's hard to do that for yourself, I think. And it's hard to do it, but you have to do it for yourself. And, and as a leader, you have to do it for other people too. Sometimes. Absolutely. It's called boundaries. There's, there's a lot of great therapy and workshops on that. <laughs> and it's so a, everybody is afraid, right? Yeah. Everybody Absolutely. is very fearful right now for their jobs, for, you know, they don't know what's, what's happening. They, and so a lot of people are, you know, over delivering and over delivering is good, but it's not when it comes at, you know, when it's coming from sort of a dark place. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think that's been interesting for myself as well as in the organization. Yeah. We have one question that I like to um, bounce to you, David, here around um, as a team of one in events and relying heavily on the collaborative environment of work and now that not existing, do you have any ways to keep the creative spirit alive on your team as it is? Uh, you know, we, yeah, it's a good question. It, I mean, I think we're lucky because we're in an incredibly creative space. I mean, like I said, everything we're doing is, is about problem solving for something that's creative, that's something that's intended for public, you know, public good for something that's, I mean, mostly what we're doing is free. Um, I think that really keeps people inspired, um, just the type of work they get to work on. I think, and so I think we have tried to be really conscientious about because there's always work that is also you know you're slugging through what you're doing i think we've just tried to be extra conscientious of like giving people exposure to the parts of the work that is what gives them some fulfillment mm -hmm. um you know for instance try and make you know encourage our staff to be out you know helping muralist paint that kind of thing i mean yeah are there other things they need to be doing? Yes, there are. But, you know, it, sometimes little things like that, um, that's what keeps people moving. You know, we try and do sort of meetings in the park and we actually had a, a staff kickball game at one point, which was pretty hilarious. Uh, right. COVID friendly California kickball. But the, um, but yeah, primarily I think it's, you know, people are, they have things that drive them and you need to spend time with them to understand both how that relates to the organization and how it relates to them personally and make sure that they're, they're still engaged with those things and still, still feeling connected because that's where you, that's what will keep people moving through, through the difficulty is when Absolutely. they're, their batteries are full essentially. Yeah. Full and movement and forward and creativity. And I, um, I'm reading this great book about becoming a monk and, um, 
one of the, the nuggets is to go somewhere different and you don't have to go far to go somewhere different. And it can be just a different route that you've never taken. And it might be a different trail up a mountain and the power of be it nature, be it outside, um, be it a different mode of transportation gets our brains to think differently. And sometimes we think that it takes humans to ignite creativity. And sometimes it takes us as a human to be somewhere different, to ignite our own creativity. And I think it's important that we acknowledge what that, you know, it, we might not always need other people to help spark things within us, but we might need us to do things differently to spark that within us. So that's what I would offer um, in addition to what David shared for sure. And Lisa, um, of course, we must touch on you. Yeah, I'll be quick. I'm recognizing time too, but I'm so glad that we, we got this question a few days ago to think about. And I, I really appreciated that because like David, I just sort of work all the time. I'm in my home and that's what I do. But yeah. I really have two things that I've changed. One, I've gotten back into running. That's not revolutionary, but it is wonderful. Yes. Um, but it's the liberty that I have felt to be able to do that at any time. So right. in my old world, if noon came and went and I didn't do my run or go out and do my exercise, I had considered it a write-off and I just didn't get the time. So now some of my best runs are at two o'clock, 11 o'clock, three o'clock. And those ones that are in the middle of the day, I can actually come back and continue to work um, and feel a little bit more energized. So I hope going back into the workplace, that, that liberty of just being able to put it in whenever I need to, I, I hope that I can continue that. Um, the other thing, um, again, really quick, and I think it's because we're all, the entire planet is in this COVID world. And there's so many more things like this venue today. There's seminars, podcasts, collectives, forums, and I have actually soaked those up. Um, I feel like I'm able to do more of them because I'm here at home perhaps. Um, and there's nuggets and I literally have them on a whiteboard that I take from each and every one of those. And they're really little and really easy. Um, but they stick with me in terms of my leadership. Some of them build back better. Let's just take this crisis and um, figure out how to go forward and, uh, and take these opportunities. Um, never waste a good crisis. Like yes. that, that's yes. from a very famous person. We probably all heard it, but really it's such good advice. Uh, disagree and commit. How beautiful is that? We don't have time often during this to really and I touched on it before, to come to a consensus, but let's trust each other enough to, to commit to things and get them done. Um, and the other one is shift your leadership style. And I, I stole this from Smart and Savvy, but they have put together a framework for COVID, so a leadership framework. And it really just has four steps, survive, revive, rise, and thrive. So we all survived the, the April, May, which I have no idea where those months went. Then we sort of revived ourselves and we started to rise and take these opportunities. And I really believe that we're going to thrive from this. And there'll be another crisis that we'll live through and we'll thrive from. Um, and, you know, we had a marketing um, collective forum this morning at nine. And we spent, I was telling some of the um, attendees here before we started, we spent 30 minutes discussing Zoom fatigue and what that looks like and maybe question the next Zoom you're on. So. Anytime you're on these, uh, you just, you learn, there's insights, there's learnings. And um, I, I think I'm going to be a better leader going forward because of it, because I've taken the time to not, not only nourish my brain, but um, my body, my brain, everything. Amazing. I love that, Lisa. I want to offer two things on Zoom. And I have one last question for you, Polly, and we're going to wrap in two minutes. Um, my two suggestions on Zoom are show up without food don't eat. It's one place to not eat. It actually makes a really big difference. And the second is to fix your face. And if you sit on Zoom with a smile and not with some like disgruntled, I'm going to just like sit here with a flat line and think it's okay. If you smile, your increased joy of Zoom goes up by so many percent. I made that stat up, but just fix your face. And when you can say that to other people on Zoom, like fix your face, just I dare you to smile and we can get through this really quickly and have a good time. It's important. I digress, no more Zoom fatigue. The last question, Polly, feels important. 
And that is, we're planning for 2021. And how much of a runway do you feel like we can be planning for right now? Are you leaning toward keeping things virtual um, or are you planning for a shift that things might be different? David, I would never say back to how they were, but you know, what, what is the future and how far of a runway do you have for 2021? I'm going to answer that one in a second, but my other tip for just joy in general, working from a laptop, is change your password to something really positive. So the first thing you do in the day is put in a positive word. It really makes a difference. Um, it. So planning for 2021. Well, because we work in retail and technology at Best Buy, our philosophy has always been we have a five-year strategic plan, but we change every day. We're constantly evolving. Um, we're constantly agile. And we have to be because that's the industry that we're in. Um, and it hasn't really changed. Our strategy really hasn't changed with COVID. It's the same thing. Um, we need to be in innovative. We need to lead, lead and set the pace. Um, we will create what we think uh, a financial forecast is going to look like, but we analyze that every day. We have data telling us what's changing every day. We use con consumer insights. Um, so we've never had a pandemic like this before. This isn't SARS. It's different. Um, the whole economy, the whole globe is going through it. So, so yeah, we're planning for the best and then we're adaptable and, and being agile for anything that gets thrown, thrown at us every day and, and expect it. it it's going to get thrown at us. This year is not over. 2020 is not, <laughs> it's not done yet. Scott, I want to ask you, are you planning for hybrid events? Are you considering I in real life, <laughs> like IRL <laughs> events? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, in the in the conversations that I'm having with partners or, or other or events, I'm challenging them. It's okay to in the future to plan for an event that has people in it, but we just can't sit back and expect that to be the reality. So we're really challenging our the people that we're partnering with to say, what are your eventualities? I think that's a change is that, you know, there's no more sort of capitulation. You kind of have to have a backup and a backup and a backup. And that's an yeah. extra workload. I'm aware of it, but it's just, um, it's the reality of where we're at. So okay. are we planning for in real life events? Yes. But we're also making sure that there's a contingency plan if those things don't happen because okay. we need to have, we need to have opportunities. We need to be, we need to be aware of what we're going to do. Yeah. Love mm -hmm. it. Yes, David. Drop uh, the mic for us. We're at 1202. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I'll be really quick. But yeah, I mean, when we're looking at 2021, I mean, one thing I didn't mention is that this summer we were able to create uh, an in-person event, one of the, one of the few, a, th a three-week-long uh, pop-up patio with events uh, every night for th basically for three weeks um, with all the COVID safety protocols outdoors. Um, and, and from that, you know, we're always trying to push forward to how can we, you know, it's more like, how can we do it? Um, you know, I think having the, we know that we have a model now that can work, you know, in COVID or whatever, but, um, you know, even this winter we're partnering with, uh, you know, some of the BIAs like downtown BIA and, and a few other partners looking at doing like augmented reality, projection mapping, other types of art, you know, how do we create, well, it's the new version of sort of the winter gathering, because I think, you know, as much as we needed the art and we needed this presence in our communities in the summer, like we, like the winter is Need going it. to be a whole other thing. So yeah. I think looking forward, it's just like, it, the innovating is never over. It's like, you kind of have to just be like, okay, but what else, you know, what else? What else Absolutely. What else? I love it. Team, um, may I get your consent to share your contact details with the folks that have been on this? Do we have consent? Sure, yeah. Yeah, okay, great, that's so easy. See how easy it is to get things done on Zoom? Um, Tanya will send that out. This has been recorded, it will be shared. Thank you for your time. Uh, if there are other specific questions, I would suggest that we send them to um, panelists directly and we must wrap time integrity. Thank you. Thanks, Seth, thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.